Hey, what's up everyone? Charlie Stevenson from Alien Whoop, and today we're going to build one from start to finish. Okay, so here we have an Alien Whoop 2.1. New in the bag. There's a little alien guy in there. Got a cockroach frame. Super durable. Super easy to build. Uh, we got an all-in-one camera, the VTX, built into it. Um, FR Sky XM receiver. We got some props from a Beta FPV. Those are by blades. Just uh, for show and tell, I'll show you guys an RXSR receiver. Uh, I can show you like a Futaba receiver. You know, uh, some other receivers. We got some awesome sauce motors from TinyWhip.com. A little bit of welder's glue. Um, tools that you might see me use throughout the video. Um, wire snips. Uh, certainly a couple bucks on Amazon. They work really well. Um, something to strip your wires with so that you can remove the uh, insulation and get them just right. Um, this is like a tip cleaner. I would highly recommend you use that if their soldering iron came with a little sponge. Just throw it away. Um, the solder that I like, maybe a little different than what most of you are used to using. It has a uh, 2% silver in it. Uh, this is some Radio Shack Flux from the 80s that I still use to uh, desolder stuff. I use one of these desoldering copper braids. And then this stuff here is like, this is the magical flux, you know? Forget everything you know about soldering. Like, you could use anything on the planet just about to solder with. If you have this MG Chemicals Flux, it's going to look absolutely beautiful. Um, you'll need like a tiny Phillips screwdriver. Um, this one's made by Stanley, but you know, anything will do. May or may not want to use something like a little multimeter to check for continuity. Tweezers, ESD tweezers. Um, I like these little sharp pointy ones for fine work. Um, battery tester, optional. Uh, some kind of a soldering iron, preferably temperature controlled. This is an old one I had laying around rather than clean up my build area. I'm just showing you guys on this little mock-up build area. Um, GoPro, whatever, just for me to record. Uh, something to hold your flight controller with. Um, these are kind of neat little spring-loaded stations, or if you have one of those little helping hands, just put some heat shrink over the, uh, the little alligator clip so you don't scratch the surface of the, uh, or especially remove the solder mask of the flight controller. Um, you're just going to clamp it in there. This is a version 2 flight controller, Alien Whoop V2. And um, on that version, we had these three little holes that you could use to add your receiver. And for some people, that proved kind of challenging to solder. It's kind of close together. So at the end of the video, hopefully you'll end up with something like that. Uh, that's like a completed finished whoop there um, with a canopy dipped by Ed Petroka. Uh, this is a six millimeter whoop with awesome sauce and actually has a run cam DVR in it. And this is a seven millimeter whoop with a not fast enough canopy and uh, Eosheen. No, this is a Beta FPV 65S frame to accommodate stick lipos. Both of these are designed for stick lipos. This one actually has a zero in it, uh, Alien Whoop Zero Flight Controller. Maybe I'll show you guys that later on. So if you ordered from Alien Whoop, um, right now we're shipping the flight controller in this little ESD bag just because they're easy to use with a little alien toy and um, some decals to go on your frame. So this is kind of our standard case. It's a little plastic jewel case. If it's an alien whip zero, it'll say zero on it and be slightly different decoration. You just pop it open. Um, inside the foam are all your screws and grommets and stuff, so save those for later. And um, here's the flight controller. It's already got a pigtail soldered on. It's already got the motor plugs, um, USB port. Uh, this little chip is your black box chip. Maybe we'll get into that in a later video. And uh, you can see compared to the version two, wherever that ended up going. Um, you know, instead of these teeny tiny little holes to solder to um, and a beeper, we put these nice big, um, 
pads rather that you could solder to and space them out a little bit more. Um, we even put a TX and RX pad for Crossfire, easy to go on the bottom. If you're using FR Sky or Futaba inverted, you want to use RX2, um, which is this one. 3.3 uh, volts and ground, so your uh, 5 volt receivers generally run off of 3.3 volts also. Same with Crossfire, you want to pick those four. If you're a Spectrum person, you're going to pick these three RX3 ground and 3.3 volts. This is a dedicated inverter chip for FR Sky, so that goes to RX2, just to reiterate that. Orient you to your flight controller if you've never looked closely at one. This is your gyro. Be really careful around that. You want to disturb it. This is the F4 processor. Overclocked right now, this is outperforming every other Betaflight chip, including F7, uh, as of the time of this video. Although they've been working really hard on F7. Cool thing about this design is we can replace this chip with an F7, and we just throw a capacitor here where this uh, zero ohm jumper is. There we go. These little squares are MOSFETs. These are your motor power, 40 mil traces, two ounce copper. On the top, we got an RX2 and TX2 again. Uh, RX2, what you saw on the bottom, and that's the inverted RX2. If you're not using that one, you can use RX2 on the top for something else. RX4 and TX4, you know, if you want to do uh, smart audio, things like that, these pads on the top will help you. And in the pilot's guide, we give you a, like little chart, little tables of everything that you might possibly need to know about hooking this up. Right here, you got your little pads to solder on, your uh, all-in-one camera, your VTX, or anything else that needs LiPo power. So you could just solder directly to the pigtail, but sometimes, you know, it falls out or, um, you know, the get a cold solder joint. So rather than have people solder to the pigtail leads directly, uh, you can just solder to these little pads and you know, in the PCB, they, they touch each other. Uh, if you want to bridge and just kind of put a huge blob of solder over both, um, that's okay. All three of these, this is the USB ground. So don't worry if your soldering skills aren't up to par. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay if these are touching, just as long as there's a gap in between these two so you don't get a big puff of smoke when you plug in. So, and on this, you know, this is all again in the pilot's guide. There's a plus sign and a minus sign indicating the polarity. Good to go. Let's check it out. Let's do some soldering. Okay, we're back again. Um, depending on your soldering station and the type of solder that you have, uh, you want to look online maybe, see what the ideal temperature is for that solder. Um, this station I was playing with earlier, I don't even know if this one's super accurate, but it is temperature controlled. And we're running it at about 420 degrees Celsius. So again, you got your flight controller. Um, depending how you want to hook it up. You know, these things I found really kind of convenient. Um, they're spring-loaded, um, nice and easy to uh, get your flight controller in there and have it stay exactly where you want. Um, a lot of receivers come with a little bag of uh, wire, silicone wire. Um, you don't want to use the plastic insulated wire. The plastic just melts away every time you try to solder and it shrinks back further and further. You really want your exposed wire to be minimized. You can also just get like reels of this stuff. Um, lost my focus. Which is also silicone braided wire. There we go. This is where these... Uh, Fire stripping tool comes in handy. You're just gonna, you know, put a little bit in there and strip it away. Let me move the flight controller out of the way. And I'll show you how it's done. So you're gonna untwist if you had a twisted pair. Um, usually we use yellow for signal, red for power and black for ground. So again you don't really need to expose a whole lot. Uh, and what I like to do is put a little bit of flux on there after I've exposed the wire just to hold the strands together. Sometimes when you're trying to place them 
the strands will fray and one little piece of wire strand touching another piece of wire could really cause a lot of problems. So um, I love this this MG Chemicals Flux. Um, if you see that the wires are already started to separate, you can kind of give them a little twist to hold them together. So uh, yeah, I use a ton of flux and then I clean it up with a toothbrush and rubbing alcohol. And the kind of rubbing alcohol I use, I guess it doesn't really matter, you know, just something like this, 91% uh, isopropyl alcohol. So you get your spool of wire. You probably know all this already. I'm just saying it for those who don't. Um, you know, your tip cleaner, going to jam it in there a little bit. Feel like a bunch of... Uh, you know, solder onto your tip and just let it kind of see it just sucked into the wire. You want to breathe that stuff in, so make sure you have good ventilation. And uh, ooh, nice and shiny now. So it can also be helpful to tin up the pads on the flight controller. So in this example, I'm going to use an FR Sky receiver. Um, because that's what I have available. But uh, so I'm going to tin the RX2, which is that uninverted signal pad that you need for S bus, um, unless you're using something like an RXSR with the uninverted pad. Um, generally, for Futaba and FR Sky compatible, you're going to need something like this. So do a little flux. Uh, you saw, like I just put a ton of flux on there, and you just kind of try not to melt the motor plug. Get some solder on all those pads. These uh, FR Sky XM receivers that we sell are pretty easy to work with because they just have three holes and they're labeled. I don't know if you can see that, but it says smart port, five volt, and ground. Uh, and really this is the, the S bus signal, this, this square pin. So square, 5 volt ground. Um, in all of our testing over the last year or more, actually a little over a year, we found that 3.3 volt works good, even with Crossfire. Uh, Wayne Ho, TBS team pilot, flies his off of 3.3 volt, his Crossfire. So there you go, that's how it's going to line up. Signal, 3.3 volts, and ground. So you can think about your placement of your antenna. If you hit this with a little bit of hot air, you know, careful not to dislodge this bind button. They're just little stickers. Um, and I've lost so many. This is my biggest complaint uh, to FR Sky is if you could just give us a big, a little bit more of a robust button. Because these things, this is just captain tape and it falls off and you're done for. So you want to heat this up a little bit. I've seen people touch an iron to it. Um, you know, it's just some kind of a glue that they use, or hot air, if you want to rotate it. But um, you can see that there are a few places where it would fit pretty nicely. If you have a larger receiver, like, what do I do with that? You know, if your receiver is this, Redcon, you're going to want to take the screws out and, you know, remove the pins from the plug. Uh, there's a little plug in there. You're going to want to hold your soldering iron against it, or even the RXSR. Um, has a, a pretty big plug. Um, you put flux along those pins and you heat it up with lots of extra solder on those pins only and you can pull the plug out with tweezers. Um, so that's a bit of more of a surgery. That's again why we like these um, little RXSRs um, or I'm sorry XM receivers. So you don't need a lot of wire um, you can see, depending where you want to place it, like that fits pretty good right there. Depending on the frame that you use, to do a little surgery. Most of the flight controllers out there up to this point use a built-in receiver, so... You know, we want to get a little bit better range signal quality, so usually what I do is I cut out this X, and I'll show you that in a minute, to accommodate the receiver without putting any pressure on it. I usually also think about which side of this receiver that I want to face up 
and I'll put the wires coming out that side. So I'm thinking I want the bind button to be visible. So I'm going to put some flux on the top side, actually the bottom side, and I'm going to push the wires through the top side to the bottom. So let's put some flux. Actually, we can put the wires in first. might make our lives a little bit easier. So, you know, follow the diagram that came with it. You can try to do all the wires at once. Um, this is where those helping hands come in. Uh, you know, the, these ones are great for flight controllers, not so great for holding the, uh, the receiver. So I'll use one of these instead. So the top wire, that square one, sometimes square is power, sometimes square is signal. On the FR Sky, it seems like square is signal for them. So we'll just feed it through one side and just tap. And this is why I love this flux. And get it focused. Look at that. Yeah, it just looks like jewelry. The positive wire. You know, if your fingers are kind of heat resistant, mine are after a while, you can just hold it with your finger. Clean the tip regularly, kind of makes the life a little bit easier. And finally, we'll do ground. Honestly, sometimes I also just hold them in my hand. Because then you can push the back of it with your finger if, uh, if you have pretty heat sensitive fingers and make sure that no insulation is exposed on the other side. A little bit of the ground wire exposed so we can just push it forward a little bit. That looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit more on the signal wire. You know? Um, take your time with this step so you don't have to tear your whip completely apart. Um, And that's that's half of it. Now, this is just a little salsa dish with uh, an old toothbrush. And this is what I do. Um, I dip the toothbrush in there and I scrub the heck out of it. I do that with all my electronics. Um, careful again of that bind button. The alcohol can loosen the um, adhesive on the button. And if you want to really be a Weight Watcher, you can also take your snips and um, cut these down flush. Like that. These ones didn't have a lot exposed, but you know, if you didn't, if you cut your wires, exposed a little too much insulation. I cut a little too much insulation, you know, cut those short because you don't want them bumping out. I like to twist my wires. Um, I don't know, I'm supposed to maybe reduce the uh, interference a little bit. Twist it up. These are your indicator LEDs on the XM for bind and connectivity. Um, and this, again, this little captain tape button. That's your bind button. So that thing is super fragile. If you have clear heat shrink, you might want to cover it. If it falls off, all you need to do to bind is solder a piece of wire between the two pads that are under it. So you can take a soldering iron and just pull the whole thing off and put a piece of wire across or, you know, hold your tweezers across it until you're bound. And then you never need to mess with it again unless you get a different radio or pass your quad on to somebody else. And this thing, like I said, you know, you can, sometimes you can twist it, rotate it. Um, you can cut this to length. You know, you don't need all of this really long wire. It'll save you some weight. Not much, but a little bit. Um, and you just want to make sure that you cut this to length. So FR Sky is known for maybe running 
their antenna slightly shorter than maybe everyone else in the industry. I think they say maybe it's like one fifth wave. I think the textbook is 31.2. If you just Google like 2.4 gigahertz antenna length, it will tell you. So you can trim that to length, but it's it's pretty hard. It's easy to destroy these small antennas. Um, you know, so maybe just leave it as it is, honestly. Okay, so here we are again. We've just soldered our receiver, the wires on, and we put some flux and tinned up the pads on the flight controller, and now we want to attach this. So what I would say is kind of get an idea again of where you want to place it so that the bind button is visible and like how much wire you're going to need. You know, the shorter the better for weight. So I just usually pinch it in my thumbs and then cut it. And then, you know, that still might even be more than we need, but um, untwist them a bit and go ahead and strip the insulation off. Make some room. You just kind of put a short length in there and you squeeze it and you pull away. And if you see that you don't have the... It's, it's better to start out short with a smaller piece and then maybe go bigger. Or uh, maybe your preference is to cut away a lot of wire and then tin it up and then trim it afterwards to length. Um, or even solder it to the flight controller with a long lead and, and not care. But I'm thinking you were going to want to um, keep the leads pretty short, like about the size. I'll show you up closer. So you want to keep your wires, the exposed portion of the wire, about the size of these little pads. So, you know, clean the tip. Um, maybe put a little solder on there um, just to wet it. And then I like to solder it, you know, kind of going in that direction. So you can start with yellow, to the RX pad, and this comes out a lot cleaner when you're not holding a camera and, and everything else. You can use tweezers if you want. You don't want to burn your fingers or whatever. You know, black is ground the way that I'm doing it. Just make sure you got the same colors connecting on both sides where they're meant to go. Uh, like it helps if you use red, black, and yellow, then you know, anybody who looks at your quad will know what you're doing uh, later on. I'll just clean it up real good. I use a lot of that rubbing alcohol. That looks pretty good. Okay, so we just finished up the receiver, as you can see. Um, Bind button will be exposed. We'll cover this up in heat shrink or um, somehow or other keep it from shorting out. You know, you don't want to have it exposed and these little leads can touch those little leads and you get a nice spark. So, um, what we want to do next is the camera. So, we want to solder the camera pigtail here and here. The camera that I've chosen for this video is this cheap little. FPV AIO camera. There it is. A lot of us use the uh, FX900 from Tiny Wolf or the Cyclops V2 from Team Turbo Wing. Depending on the camera you get, um, these little all in ones are nice. This one has like a little UFL connector, and you can just fold it down, and then that can just shoot right out the back of the whoop. And those two leads need to go onto the flight controller. That magic MG Chemicals flux.
and then you're going to go ahead and take your micro USB and I plug it in. There we go. If you've already hooked up your camera, your receiver, like all kinds of things are going to be flashing. Uh, you can totally wait until your whoop is all built to do this, but um, it doesn't hurt to get it out of the way ahead of time. Okay, so we're going to start a beta flight, and I intentionally have an older version of it installed. And Joshua Bardwell put out a public service announcement about this. If you're not using 10.3.1, if you're using, especially if you're using 10.3.0, that could end up causing some major issues for you. So go ahead and make sure that you go to the release website, click on that link, uh, or you can just search Beta Flight Configurator, and it's on GitHub and on the releases tab and download whatever you need for your operating system and depending on your connection speed you might want to go make a cup of coffee take a walk once it's downloaded you go ahead and open it up if you have it open you need to close it click retry click finish run beta flight configurator so when you see COM3 or whatever it may be on your computer, uh, if you have a Mac, it may look a little bit different than this uh, on Windows. Um, go ahead and click Connect. And at the factory, these are loaded with uh, Betaflight 3.4 that we home compiled. Uh, Betaflight 3.4 wasn't available at the time. So uh, you could go ahead and run this, um, but the latest changes I've put into Beta Flight 3.4 are now uh, merged, so go into command line, CLI, and type BL, and hit enter, and it'll say restarting in bootloader mode. Now you see DFU over here. That's what we want to see. Um, DFU mode, we go to firmware, flasher tab. Um, check the box here to show unstable releases. We want release and release candidate in this case. Make sure you select Alien Loop F4. Um, one of these other alien flight controllers. Um, you don't need to check no reboot sequence. Make sure you check full chip erase. We're just going to erase everything. And down here we'll show you some of the release notes about that firmware. Um, oh, and choose a firmware version for Alien World F4. I, I skipped one. So at the point of this video, um, we're now up to on July 2nd. Beta Flight 3.4.0 RC5, release candidate 5. Maybe by the time you get your flight controller, um, 3.4 will be final, uh, or even revised beyond that. But you can click Load Firmware Online. It's going to download the latest and greatest version of the firmware. And they note, you know, this is a release candidate, it's for testing, blah, 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 things might not work. Click Flash Firmware. And you see programming successful. You can click connect. And there it is. Now, mine is in this little jig over here, but uh, if we rotate it upright, you know, you can see, you can tilt the flight controller in your hand if you want. The flight controller needs to be perfectly still to calibrate the gyro. So make sure when you plug it in that maybe it's just sitting on a level surface with a, you know, weight on the cable so it's not moving at all. And, uh, but once it is, you know, you can move it around in your hand and make sure it's, it looks correct. Uh, all this has been tested at the factory. So you'll remember that we have a pilot's guide, hopefully. If you go to shop.alienwolf.us, store, find the Alien Wolf version 2.1, or the 0, if you're playing with the 0, or the V2. For the V2, you can use the 2.1 pilot's guide. It's down here at the bottom of the page. Um, and for the version 2.1, uh, of course, we're going to grab the 2.1 pilot's guide. And there's a lot of information here. There's a table of contents. There's close to 15, 16 pages. So uh, take your time with it. First few pages are just sort of, what's this all about? What does this board have? And then uh, you get right into the functional diagram. This is this legend here with these uh, unique numbers indicating every pad that you may want to solder to. So uh, I've talked about it before. These are the RX uh, and TX pads on the top side of the board for peripherals like uh, 
smart audio, ETXs, um, you could put a receiver on top of the board as long as it doesn't need inversion. Uh, for FR Sky and Futaba, you need to run your, your receiver wire, to, signal wire to the bottom. You don't necessarily have to mount it on the bottom. Uh, one and two are your LiPo connectors, three and four are your camera connectors. Um, they're on the same uh, plane underneath the solder mask. We just it makes the wiring a little cleaner to have a separate pad, and you reduce the risk of the pigtail maybe falling out or getting a cold solder joint. So, bottom of the board, um, quite a lot of pads on the bottom. We just wanted to make it really easy to build, space them apart a little bit more than the previous board. And here's the boot pads that I talked about. If you brick your flight controller, uh, you know, the cord comes unplugged while you're flashing it, or you put uh, you know, the wrong version of the firmware on there, you know, the Alien uh, Wolf F7 on an F4, and it won't boot. Bridge these two pads with some solder or tweezers, and uh, while they're bridged, plug it in. You should go into DFU mode, and then you can flash. So, a little bit about these pads. If you go to the next page, um, and we can, I guess, make this full screen. You know, Moni went through and really thoroughly documented everything. So, pad number eight is what I use. RX2 uh, is an uninverted pad. Uh, make sure you just read each of these very carefully. And um, on the next page, page is this, page seven. Or actually, page eight is the one I was looking for. Page eight talks about your receivers, right? So we used an S bus receiver with an inverted signal from the factory. Um, Utaba, you know, and FR Sky inverted their signal, so you need to uninvert it. And the F4 is incapable of it. F3, F0, F7, all capable of uninverting the signal, but the F4 can't. So we have a little external chip. It's one way. So you can't use that for F port or some of the fancier protocols. Uh, and that's UR2, pad 18. Where's pad 18? Scroll back up. You might want to even print this out and just kind of figure it out. So we're going to put signal on pad 18, power on 17, ground on 16. And you saw that in the video earlier. If you had DSMX, you know, like I said earlier when I was showing it visually, um, these are the pads for Crossfire. These are the pads. There's really a lot of good information in here, so be sure to check all that out. So the first thing you want to do after you connect, you know, and you've kind of verified that things are working, is go ahead into the Ports tab and make sure that your Serial RX column uh, corresponds to the correct pad that you solder to. So we solder to pad 3, I mean pad 2, UART 2 RX. So let's uncheck UART 3. Don't play with this pad here, this configuration MSP. If you uncheck that, this USB VCP, you won't be able to connect with the USB port in the configurator. You don't have to reflash your board uh, from you know, using the boot pads. So we're going to set UART 2. I'm not using telemetry or smart port or anything like that on this build, so I'm going to click save and reboot. It may come back, it may not, depending if you've checked auto connect, so I'll click connect. Configuration tab. Um, there are a few people who've built a plus configuration, whoop, um, but we're using quad X, the these are our target defaults, motor direction reverse, props out. So, you know, if you are used to beta flight, props spinning in, you know, towards the center, and you build your whoop the way that you thought it should go, and you plug it in, and you arm, and you do everything just right, and you hit the arm switch, it's going to spin in circles really fast, like a Tasmanian devil in the old cartoons. So, make sure that if you want to run your, boater, your motors in beta flight configuration, to uncheck this, and you see this little diagram, now they're, they're props in. Some people think that this is uh, maybe a little better for split S's and uh, fighting prop wash. I don't know, personally I, I prefer props out, and uh, the other team pilots did as well, so we went with that. Um, protocol, 
even on brushed motors. Um, PWM speed separate from the PID loop is fine. In the original version of the Alien Up V2, um, we had a low PWM rate. I found like the lower rates seemed really powerful, really crunchy, so I had it at 666, which is the highway I used to live on. In the new version, uh, based on a lot of our silverware research, it just seemed like the shorter pulses um, were a lot more responsive. You know, if you hit a gate and your PID loop was at 16 kilohertz and PWM frequency was at least at that same rate, you know, a higher rate than, than the low rates we were running before, that the quad could respond uh, very quickly and, and you were less likely to, you know, have that bump into the gate precipitate into a full-on crash tumble situation. Min throttle, um, we'll get to that in a little bit, but you'll want to plug in a battery and throttle up on the motors tab and just see what what signal do you need to just barely spin the props. And we recommend um, you know setting that high enough so that your props are always spinning so that and with air mode enabled. Um, you'll see down here in the features air mode permanently enabled so that your props don't stall. Because uh, a whoop motor isn't really powerful enough to start them up again in a dive or something like that. If you want to mount your flight controller upside down, Benedict Hawk style, you know, micromotor warehouse, um, we're not going to get into that here, but this is how you would do it. Basically flip it 180 and roll and uh, remap the motors as appropriate. Our target defaults enable the 32 kilohertz gyro. We're using 16 kilohertz sampling. 16 kilohertz pit loop. It's possible with overclocking that you might be able to run higher, but uh, it may become unstable, may become too hot. Arming, we, uh, you know, with a whoop especially, you know, if your whoop's upside down or sideways in a tree, you want to be able to get it down. And if you disarmed and, and this wasn't set to 180, you wouldn't be able to arm when the quad was upside down. So this allows you to arm in any position. So I recommend not changing that. Craft name. Uh, not really applicable without OSD, but um, you know if you want it to show up, go ahead and put in a name there. Accelerometer, some people who fly acro only um, in freestyle and they really want to push the high rates, disable ac the accelerometer. No angle mode will work, no horizon mode will work, there's no self-leveling, so if you can't fly without self-leveling, don't uncheck that. But uh, if you need a little bit more CPU, Power, so you can run 32, 32, perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually possible, but you would uncheck that. I'm gonna leave it checked. Leave it 180. Um, we just put a serial-based receiver, so you know that's the target default. Leave it alone, unless you know what you're doing. Our default is for Spectrum, but I just put an S-bus receiver on FR Sky. Um, if you have FR Sky F port, it's kind of or Crossfire or Flysky, kind of beyond the scope of this video, but uh, that's where you would pick it from the drop-down menu. Um, might be worth noting that 1024 is only used by one particular protocol, and that's all enumerated in here. For DSMX, you need to do a little bit of extra work. You need to copy and paste these things into the command line to set up the binding and Spectrum 1024 is only used by DSM2 at 22 milliseconds. It's not used by the 11 millisecond protocol or any of the DSMX protocols. So, anyways, we're not using DSMX, so we're set to SBUS. Leave all the defaults here. Some people don't like the props to spin up when they arm, but uh, I'm just going to suggest you leave it alone, leave air mode on. Leave anti-gravity on, dynamic filter. If you want to squeeze out a little more uh, processing power, you know there are some folks that would prefer to disable the dynamic notch and, and use the black box that we've put on board to set their notches explicitly and uh, use the old old method. These are all your beeper settings. You could leave those alone. Power and battery. There's no no onboard. Voltage monitoring or current sensor on a 2.1, so we could just set those both to none. PID tuning, you know, we worked really hard with not fast enough Travis Schrock using black box and analyzing the data to get PIDs that were not just guesswork or sort of based on you know, 
slowing down the video and doing flips and rolls and just seeing if it bounced. Um, these are based on you know, lots of reading the tea leaves, black box analysis, um, using a tool called Plasma Tree Pit Analyzer, uh, getting graphical uh, feedback and really trying to pick something that worked well for both 6 and 7 millimeter motors. So I suggest you leave these alone uh, unless you're going to run different configuration than, than the usual six or seven millimeter HV type of setup. It's kind of beyond the scope of this document, but you know, feel free to play with the rates. We use the old fashioned RC rates in RC Expo instead of Super Expo. It just seemed to fly a lot better. Um, and you can pick set point weight and transition to taste, uh, anti-gravity gain, we don't, we're a little bit on the fence with anti-gravity. Um, it seemed like the higher threshold for me was working well. Travis seemed to think that anti-gravity was actually more harmful than helpful. Uh, so, you know, picking a higher threshold would prevent it from being enabled anyways. A lot of freestyle pilots like to crank up TPA, um, and that just kind of smooths out the PIDs across the whole range of the throttle, is my understanding. Uh, receiver tab. Uh, we set FR Sky, so let's change the channel map to AETR. If you have RSSI on a channel, you could click that. Stick low threshold if your quad won't arm for some reason. In the factory, I had set these to 1000. Now we're setting them to 1025. You might even want to do 1050. If you have a lot of jitter in your transmitter and you can't arm due to throttle uh, readings showing above you know, the, this threshold, just bump it up a little higher. This this affects your throttle resolution. So if you have a really clean, you know, high quality signal, you can maybe go 1,000 and 2,000. That's what I used to do, but, but we've gone on the safe side now with 1025 and 1900. If you have a, an older transmitter with some dead band, you know, you have some jitter in, this, in the gimbals, and you don't want the quad to interpret those as your own stick movements, you can raise dead band. RC interpolation, we set it to manual, 14 milliseconds. You can try auto, you can try off. Uh, it's up to you, and you can preview all of your weights and things like that down in this little preview. Modes, um, you're going to want to add a mode for ARM. I like to use AUX3 for ARM. Some people use AUX1. Let's just say you, you wanted to use AUX1 and maybe you wanted angle mode, right? You just want to fly in level mode. Uh, again, this is well documented in many, many places in Joshua Bardwell videos and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Blue Falcon videos, you name it. So go on Google, go on YouTube and search, you know, how to set up a beta flight quad if you need uh, really intricate detail on all of these settings. But the basics is, you know, set an arm switch, put angle on it, or if you want to do if you have two switches, two channels available, or some way of, multi, of uh, putting multiple information on one channel, um, you can do mo more modes. Like I like to have ARM on AUX3. I like to have AUX2 be my uh, channel. I usually do two rate profiles, so I have two different angle modes, and then acro, where that's not an angle mode. All to taste. For black box, you may want to put a black box erase um, toggle switch. Uh, otherwise, you know, the way the data flash works, you only get one log. Um, and you need to go and clear that out uh, in order to log again. So if you know you're about to do a black box session with your whoop, come in here, clear out the log, or, you know, set a toggle switch and clear it out. Fly around, you know, for. 10, 20 seconds and the different patterns that they recommend. Plug it in, download the log, erase it, repeat. Uh, motors tab, like I said, you can you know, plug in your motors and click on the master tab. And I usually just use the up arrow and kind of bump it up until the motor starts spinning smoothly and evenly. Um, you, know, you might find with some of the high KV batteries, oh, you need to have a battery plugged in. Plug a light bulb in, but don't leave it connected for very long. It can actually charge over the USB. Um, so I liked around 1050, maybe 
if you're if it's hopping around all over the place, you might want to go 1025, 1020, or even lower. Find the setting that's best for all four of your motors to spin without effort. Black box to erase, you click the black box tab, click erase. Yes, I really want to erase. Wait a while. We put an 8 megabyte flash chip on there, so you can get quite a lot of uh, flight time at even a higher logging rate. Um, our default is 4 kilohertz, which is one quarter our gyro sampling rate default gyro sampling rate, and that's what's recommended by Plasma Tree Log Analyzer for uh, being able to really check things out. Black box analysis is outside the scope of this document, but um, there's a lot of good information out there. The CLI, um, you know, the most important thing you could probably learn is to type diff, D-I-F-F space all A-L-L, -L. hit enter, and click save to file, and you know, dump that configuration somewhere safe. Um, because if you ever need to reset your book, you'd have to go through and redo that all over again. So you're all done with that. Um, you plug your flight controller and go test hovering. Okay, so now that we've soldered on the camera and the receiver, we can go ahead and build the whoop. I am using a newbie drone cockroach um, this is probably the best frame on the market right now for six millimeter motors um, it's got a lot of reinforcements it's it's very thin plastic but pretty durable um, and it's well adapted for uh, 17 millimeter motors uh, six millimeter motors that are 17 millimeters tall you can cut out this little clip there or that little post rather um, and, you know, the way that we've put our receiver with these external receivers, um, on whichever frame you have, you may want to cut out this central section just to provide a little bit more room. So the flight controller itself provides stability. Uh, so it's okay to do that. So you can see I just cut out that little X right there. Save the little weight. Um, flight controller will add stability where that had been. Personally, what I like to do is, I used to try to run the battery through this side, the battery pigtail, and then I realized like maybe when they designed this, these were uh, intended to be the front, you know, to provide a little bit more front impact uh, for a head-on collision. You're doing crazy acro. So I, I often put the battery pigtail through the back now and this little post, um, I just run three screws just to reduce the weight a little bit. So I actually cut that off. I don't know if you can see, I usually cut this flush um, just to give a little bit more room for the USB port to not rub against the frame. Um, if you're running a screw down canopy, you can cut these posts off. If you're running one of the tiny whip canopies, leave them on. Um, in the flight controller jewel case, you should have received a little bag with grommets and screws. These rubber grommets provide some vibration damping. Just dump them in your case like a little tray. And the way it works is you just grab a grommet and push it onto the post. You'll, if you cut one off like I did, you'll have one extra. Um, in case you lose one on the carpet or something like that. So pick them up, push them on, just like that. Take your flight controller with your camera already attached. And I've shortened this uh, battery pigtail. If you're good at soldering and you want to shorten your wires as short as possible, feel free to do so. Save a couple of grams here and there, it all adds up and feed the receiver antenna through there. And what you want to do is look for this arrow that points forward. This is your gyro on the 2.1, that arrow that points forward, and your USB should be out the back. So if you cut out the rear post like I did, then you're going to make a little triangle in the front with the flight controller. You can see that once the flight controller is clicked into place, um, it's considerably more rigid. 
the camera that I'm using again is just a little generic AIO. Depending on the camera that you receive, you might have any any number of different. Um, depending on the camera you've received, you may have a different style mount that I'm going to use. Uh, but just use whatever is appropriate for that camera. So again, here here are some different style mounts. This one is on Thingiverse. Um, it's by Paul Crowsdale, and uh, has a little bit of a support here to hold your VTX off of the F4, and it will stay a little cooler that way. Um, these work best printed out of something like Nylon 910 or Nylon X, where you know you have flexibility and strength, and they're they're rather lightweight. This is ABS, which uh, I just want to show you. Like ABS is pretty pretty much not going to work well, right? Uh, same with PLA. This is printed out of nylon 910, and you can see it's it's very durable, um, and that's what we want. So this is a not fast enough camera mount, ultra minimal. Just basically has a little yoke to um, hold the camera. And uh, it's hard to print any of these nylon fibers without a little bit of stringing, but nobody's going to see that. We're going to hide it under the canopy. You just click it in like that, and you're going to line it up sort of like so, and you're going to screw it down. Um, it's also possible to run with no canopy, but uh, the first thing you're, that's going to happen when you crash really hard is you may break your camera and be out a considerable amount of money. So here's a nice little canopy that I've got as a gift from Jesse, all the team pilots and um, invitational guests receive these. And um, it's really nice. It's dipped by Ed Petroka. It's some kind of a cartoon comic hydro dip. Um, and I think this is called the Razor Skin uh, Canopy. Really nice lines on it. These are very lightweight, but they also are uh, you know, made out of polystyrene so they can crack pretty easily in a hard crash. If you want a little bit more strength, actually a lot more strength um, for really hard acro, you can use a different style canopy. This is a not fast enough canopy and the, the important difference is not so much the shape of the canopy but the, the material. This is made out of high density polyethylene, HDPE, and you can really just mangle this canopy and like it will just bend back. Um, and you know, if you make it out of the thicker HDPE, you could even hammer a nail into the wall with it. These are designed to be really lightweight. The, um, the regular mullet, not the mohawk, weighs about 0 0.3 grams. Um, which is very light. So if you have a not fast enough canopy you're going to want to put the screws, put this, you know, cut it out with a razor blade all along the edge. Cut out the center of this, but you know, just the in inner portion of it and take a sharpie and shove the sharpie through there and that will stretch it out for your camera lens to fit just perfectly. And you start the screws in there, and then you would line it up with your uh, camera mount and put the screws through the camera mount and then place that whole assembly down. For a tiny whip style canopy, you put the screws in first. Again, you need a little screwdriver of some kind, a little Phillips screwdriver. Um, there are different types of screws that we give people, uh, depending on your needs. Some of them have this little flange on them, this little built-in washer. Uh, they're called like a pan head washer screw or different names like that. And that one really will hold the grommet uh, pretty well. But um, if you want to save weight, we have some without that pan head washer. They're very tiny. And so you just need to make sure that that wouldn't sort of come loose. Uh, so let's just see, can we get away with it? It looks like if we were to use that, that would be okay. It's um, Even though it doesn't have a washer, it's not going to go all the way through. So just to save, you know, every fraction of a fraction of a gram will add up. I'm going to use those screws. You can magnetize your screwdriver just by rubbing it against the magnet. Um, some tool belts come with 
the little magnet on the front just for that purpose for magnetizing your, your screwdrivers. So I went ahead and started the screws and usually I place the middle screw, the front screw. Twist it in a little bit. Maybe don't tighten it all the way until you get the other one situated. If you have a V2, the whole the drills on the V2 were a little bit wide and would bow the frame so you can file it out a little bit. The V2.1 uh, and the zero line up really nicely. Um, don't bow the frame at all. Make sure that the screw is going into the post. Sometimes it can go in between the post and the grommet and then it will come loose like that. So just make sure that you give it a little tug, make sure it actually went into the post. I'm having trouble doing this. Where's the camera there? No way. To be able to pull on it with your fingernail a bit and it won't come loose. Now you can tighten them all the way. You don't want to compress the grommet too far. So that's that. I, if you have a uh, cloverleaf antenna, you just want to rotate it so that the clover is not going to hit the props when they're spinning. And likewise, if you have a dipole, you want to make sure that it's not going to fall over and get into the props, and uh, you'll be in a real bad situation then. So, um, depending on the canopy, you may need to cut a hole out the back. The way Ed Petroka does his canopies, there already is room for the VTX antenna to go out. Take off the lens cap. You may want to put some hot glue on your lens. Um, the tiny whip mounts hold it nice and rigid and straight at the perfect angle. Um, some of the mounts that are more universal, you know, you can get rotation into there. And so you may want to just go ahead and, and reinforce that. But um, this style canopy, you just line it up on the posts. Um, and with any luck, it will all fit and look really sweet. So that's it. Uh, the only thing left to do is add motors. So we've been using these um, awesome sauce motors from Tiny Whip. Um, Jesse usually gives you really cool stickers with them. I just threw it in this Ziploc because um, I lost the original bag, but usually they come in a clear, clear plastic. Um, important thing to notice is the wire colors. Um, this is well documented on other sites, but Generally, unless you're using, you know, maybe the original Inductrix motors, like all the wires, I think were the same color and just the motor caps were a different color, but the in sort of de facto industry standard is for red and blue to be clockwise rotation and black and white to be counterclockwise. And the polarity of this, if you wanted to direct solder on your zero uh, or the 2.1, removing the plugs, which I, I don't recommend, but on the 2.1 to do that, it, it's just a very small pad, but red positive, blue is negative, white is positive, black is negative. If you're using this style plug, you know, with a camera, um, and you know, you have the female equivalent of it and the male equivalent, just make sure that your positives are matching up with each other. I've seen a few people who've added something like this uh, for convenience to their flight controller and then smoked their camera when they plugged it in. But these are all good to go from the factory. Um, little trick I learned from Benedict is to just go ahead and twist them all. Um, different people have different styles of twisting. I usually just grab it and twist with my 
forefinger and thumb. Twist them all up. Important note, again, as I mentioned before, in the beta flight orientation uh, configurator portion of the video, you know, this would be beta flight default, right? Clockwise, red and blue, top down would be right there, and all the way around. For props out, that would be props in. The props would be spinning towards the center. For props out, which is our default, you're going to want to make sure that red and blue are here and on the other side. Um, so let me just show you how that would look. So this is, if you've set, if you left it at the target defaults, you're going to want to do something like this. Black and white, red and blue, black and white, red and blue. Okay. One more thing you need to do with Awesome Sauce motors uh, or ludicrous motors, any of the really tall motors, and the cockroach frame is cut out this little post. If you have um, a frame that's not long enough, you may have to just cut the bottom of this off completely uh, to accommodate them. You don't want them sticking up out of the duct. I use these little snips. I guess you could use a razor blade or whatever is convenient. I just kind of shove it in there with the the uh, <clears throat> with the snips open, and then pinch it. So I've taken those out. Um, I'm going to finish twisting up my motor wires, and then we'll install them. If you find that you're missing screws, um, one place to check is your motors. For example, this little guy has picked up a few screws. Uh, I'm going to call this just the front left, right, if front is facing forward. And I usually put my thumbnails on there and just kind of gently push. And you want to make sure that you're not somehow crushing this little wires, especially if you have something with a post still in it. Can act, the post could actually cut the wires. They're really fragile, so paid a lot of money for these motors. Don't, don't ruin them. If you have an inductrix frame, um, a lot of times it's it's a really tight fit. What I do is I hit hit this area with hot air, with a hot air gun at 100 degrees Celsius, just for in a second. You don't want to warp the frame, or I don't know. Some people breathe on them, I guess. But uh, in some way or other, you need to like heat this up or use a special tool, maybe that Tiny Whip gives you, to install the motors without breaking uh, your frame or or bending the motor shaft or, or anything else. So front left, I'm calling it. We've done counterclockwise for props in. And we'll do, looks like this one got another screw on it. We'll do clockwise on the front right. This was a car, you might say driver's side left, driver side or passenger side right, front. This was our little passenger whoop. Twist up your motor wire. You don't have to twist them, but it keeps things cleaner. Um, and again, it's supposed to maybe help with the electrical noise. So the colors go opposite each other. So if this is black and white, then you want to go diagonal. And this will be black and white because they're going to oppose each other, or complement each other. And one more. This is clockwise. And there's only one place left it can go.
could call that driver side rear, pilot side rear. So there you go. Um, the wires on some of these motors are quite long, as you can see. So if you have a special crimping tool, P Engineer PA09 is one of the favorites in the community. You could, and you're really you know enterprising, you could cut them shorter, um, or you could just wrap them around. So you'll see that they only fit in one way. There's like a little key on there. You can't, don't put them in backwards. These little exposed uh, metal portions should go forward. One thing that uh, has been pointed out by a friend of mine, um, sometimes these pins might be touching each other at the factory the way they were installed. So just make sure they're separated enough for the uh, motor to guide on there. And today I haven't found any that were too close together that I couldn't push the motor on, but So the way that this flight controller is designed the motor plug closest to the Motor itself is the one that you want to plug into What I like to do is just twist them around this way and put a little bit of heat shrink or a rubber band or tape on there. If you're doing a lot of freestyle, the motors can pop out when you crash. They just kind of, not completely out, but they'll pop up. And so some kind of an adhesive based tape will hold them in place a little bit better. But that's how I like to twist them. FPV sent me these bi-blade props. Really excited to try them out. A bunch of colors they gave me, but I was going to try this pink. So, might be easier to tell prop direction on a bi-blade. Um, you can see that one side of the propeller is low and one side is high, right? So, when this rotates this direction, the air is going to get hit this and get pushed down. Right, so this is going to spin clockwise. So clockwise is a red and blue. So let's find a red and blue. Put it on there. Push it down. Be careful with Awesome Sauce <clears throat> and some of the other motors. I uh, have kind of thin pins and um, you can really easily bend the motor shaft. So this one also looks to be clockwise. Maybe the whole bag is clockwise. Let's find out. Do we have any counterclockwise? I'm going to use white props for counterclockwise and pink props for clockwise. So see how the, the side of the prop that's down is now on the right and the side of the prop that's up on is on the left. So when it spins the opposite direction, it's going to force the air down. So Counterclockwise goes on the black and white pair. Um, so black and white wires, counterclockwise. Those are going to be white props in this video. And clockwise, pink and red and blue pair. Show you from the bottom. Clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. What if I rotate it? Do you know which one's which? Clockwise needs to spin this way. Counterclockwise, spin this way. Okay. So finally, you're going to want to plug in your LiPo and go fly. Um, the LiPos that we recommend for Alien Whoop are HV LiPos, and those are slightly different chemistry battery, and it will handle up to 3.8 volts um, as the, the sort of storage voltage and 4.35 
for the fully charged voltage. So you need a special charger for those 4.35 volts. And the Tiny Whoop, um, Jesse P, I call them, um, MyLipo batteries are probably one of the best out there, if not the best out there. Um, this one's well worn, but that's what I recommend. So you just slide it in to the tray. One trick I learned from Benedict, you can kind of flare out the sides if uh, if the lipo is on the skinny side. If it's if you've puffed it a few times, it's getting kind of fat, may not fit in as well, but push it all the way forward. One of the things that became evident in the, in the black box log was that the eye term was constantly trying to tilt the quad forward. Travis found that, so you can push that lipo out as far as you can. Uh, you may see it in your FPV feed, it's going to be so far out there. When you plug in your battery, I always put my batteries in with this little rib facing down. I always do that, and then when I'm plugging in the cord, I always rotate the cord to accommodate that little rib so that I never reverse polarity on accident. Although it always seems like you know, even with the best precautions, you know, someone's going to end up reverse polarity there. Whoop. But you plug it in, and everything should light up. You'll see some some flashing, some blinking. Um, the indicators on the flight controller, let me just show you that again. Plug it in. Set it down. See those three blinks? Let me show you again. So while it's moving, it, it's waiting for you to stop moving, calibrated. Once it stopped moving, it flashed three times. And the red, the red LED, that's your uh, receiver. So, ready? Plug it in. This one's going to blink three times. Blink, blink, blink. That means your gyro is calibrated. So, um, if you're not seeing those three flashes, if your quad's not arming, it either indicates that your gyro is busted or damaged, or maybe you just turn that setting off in the configurator. But um, once you're bound, and depending on your receiver brand and model, you know usually the uh, LED will change to green. Uh, most of the ones I've seen, and that's it. If you like this video, hit that like button, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. It's probably going to be over here in this corner. And if you want to learn more about Alien Whoop, check out our website, shop.alienwhoop.us. Have a good day.